around and say who we are. Vosick, invited guest, delayed to be here. Jim, Bishop of Deaf and Hard of Hearing. James Winston. City Councilor Mary Ann Barge. Kathy Shaughnessy, ADA Coordinator and Director for the Council on Aging. And I'm Tori Eklund, and I'm the Chair of the Commission. Um, do we have any public comment? Do we have any members of the public? No? Okay. Um, so next we can um, approve the um, minutes for June 17th. Two corrections. Okay. Um, and paragraph three, somehow it came up saying May 2013 instead of May 2013. Yes, I noticed that. Um, I had read them the first time and missed that and then noticed that I was going to point that out. So, yeah. Okay. And there's another sentence that Councilor Labarge asked me about um, something about saying city council. That's already on there. It's, um, you're talking about the minutes? Yeah. That's already on there in North Hampton City Council. Oh, that's what the part that's That's already on there. Okay. Yeah. I, I didn't understand exactly what <clears throat> Councilor Barge wanted, so I, I emailed and she called me to clarify that, because I wasn't sure where it was going to go. Okay, yeah, so. you mentioned it to me, I wasn't sure either. So just the 2013 should be 2014. Yeah. When did you pick that up? Um, about half an hour ago. Okay, hour because... We are hoping that we don't have to do corrections once we get these minutes from Patty. Yeah. If you see that we need to go ahead and make that correction, let her go yeah. ahead and correct it. I, I missed it. I proofread them yesterday, and to be honest, I, I just, none of us are perfect, and I missed it. So. And, and so did I. Yeah. So that's just that's how. Enough. That Yeah, so just <laughs> occasionally, occasionally that happens, and we just miss things. Um, so the letterhead will always be Northampton Commission on Disability and Northampton City Council, correct? Yes. And the reasons for that is just in case we have two other counselors that might show up, mm -hmm. plus me, that we're going into a quorum. And if you notice, and mostly all our city committees, correct Ruth, we have and Northampton City Council. That protects the quorum. Of city councilors coming to any meetings. Okay. 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 Do we have a motion to approve? Make a motion to approve. Third. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. So now we'll move to um, our guest speaker, Carol Rossip from the Massachusetts Commission of the Deaf and Hard of Hearing. Thank you for joining us, and um, we're very interested to hear about uh, the work that your commission is doing. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I, I appreciate Patty's invitation on behalf of the commission to allow me to come up and speak with folks here. Um, and although I'm turning this way towards the microphone, I know that you have a camera here recording the proceedings. So at times I'm going to direct my attention to, except I can't because his head is blocking the camera <laughs> view. So. <laughs> So uh, it should be a little interesting to see how we can, we can do this today. Uh, first of all, uh, I am here from the State Commission for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing, and I want to give you a little bit of an overview of the agency itself and the services that we provide. Uh, and then Patty asked me to talk a little bit more about specifically the area that I work with, which would be mostly hard uh, hearing individuals, especially those of us baby boomers and seniors or parents. Um, and issues that come up for those folks and what kinds of things that we tend to do. Um, a few of you may have seen me uh, exhibiting here at the Northampton Health and Safety Fair. We've been doing that on a fairly regular basis because it's an opportunity for us to meet with other service providers, but it's also an opportunity for us to meet face-to-face -face with folks who think that maybe hearing loss is not such a big deal, but they're having difficulty dealing with their life issues. And many of them oftentimes don't know that there is a state agency that's mandated to provide public education and training. Uh, and the Commission for Deaf and Hard of Hearing has several departments to do a number of different things. Uh, the goal primarily is to ensure that an individual with hearing loss 
whether it be culturally deaf and use a sign language, deaf blind, uh, an oral deaf individual who might have gone say, to state of school here in Northampton and knows how to speak in speech read but can't hear spoken English, uh, someone that begins to lose their hearing after they've acquired language, whether it's a seven-year-old who's had meningitis, or somebody later on in their life that notices they're pulling away from things because it's just too difficult to play bingo at the senior center or participate in events and activities, uh, and they find themselves withdrawing from family events or not enjoying phone conversations and things like that. We would call those folks late deaf and adults. Um, when you also have those of us that can benefit from amplification. So for example, today for the meeting, I brought along an assistive listening system. And at your public meetings and for those who might be participating or members of the commission who have a hearing loss, uh, providing an assistive listening system is another way to provide what we would call communication ramps. Uh, one of my colleagues uh, serves on the Commission for Disabilities in her particular community in Massachusetts. And uh, as a way for them to generate funds, they use the money from the fines for people parking inappropriately in parking spaces to be able to purchase the needed technology um, to make their meetings accessible. Um, so I'd like to give you an opportunity to actually try out an assistive listening system that I happen to be using, and I want to just explain very briefly what it does. Uh, as a communication lamp, an assistive listening device helps individuals who are considered hard of hearing who have some usable residual hearing that can be helped with amplification. And that means they may or may not be wearing hearing aids, but they can benefit from this. And those of you that do have better hearing than me might appreciate it. Um, it allows you to deal with differences that public address systems don't. Uh, with a public address system, when it's hooked up to a loudspeaker and then it sends the sound through the room, you have echo, we have reverberation, you have over amplification, and speech is distorted. You also have distance issues between you and the desired sound that you want to hear, which might be Patty's voice or something like a program that's going on or the audio coming from a movie. And you want to be able to hear that above and beyond the sea of noise that you're dealing with. So by positioning either a wireless transmitter or a key microphone or an audio feed from the sound that you want to hear into a radio transmitter or into an infrared light emitter, or into a amplifier and then feeding it to either an FM radio transmitter to broadcast it to the receivers or an infrared light emitter would fill the room with invisible infrared light. You would wear a receiver that has a little clear, uh, what looks like a little clear glass model in the front, but it's called a light receiving diode. It picks up the light, turns it back into sound and sends it up to your ear through the receiver. Um, or the room could have a loop of wire either hanging above the ceiling panels or below the floor or along the chair rail or trim. And if you're sitting within that looped area which creates a magnetic field and you have a telecoil, a little spool of wire in your hearing aid, you can activate that and send out the sound being fed directly through your hearing aid program. If you don't have that telecoil feature, you can wear a receiver that has a battery, a volume control, and that little coil of wire in it to pick up the sound that's being transmitted by that magnetic field of the loop system. So there's a number of different technologies out there that provide assistive listening devices, but the goal is to have the desired sound to come to you at a greater level of signal and minimize as much as possible the ambient noise. And you need much more of a higher signal than the person who has perfectly healthy hearing. So these technologies can be used to provide greater access for meetings, for events, for any type of communication that needs to be conveyed, and I want to just offer that up as something. Uh, what I have here for you guys to try would be an FM radio receiver. It has a volume control thumb wheel on it. There is a jack that I plugged in a pair of headphones. The cord from the headphones goes up to the headset that is worn with the cord on your left side by your left ear. If you do wear a telecoil in your hearing aid, as Ruth and I do, we're able to wear what looks like a bolo tie. It's essentially a necklace of wire with a cord. It plugs in in place of the headset, and it is now creating a magnetic field around my neck. When I activate the telecoil, the signal is then transferred into each of my behind-the-ear hearing aids. And the reason that's so critical is that when you have a severe hearing loss, you need to have the sound processed much further than a pair of headphones would do. For me, giving me a pair of headphones would mean taking off my hearing aids, It'll be like putting me in front of a rock concert loudspeaker, it'd be just noise. Mm -hmm. 
uh, given how severe my hearing loss is, the sound has to be shaped further to compensate for that. So the sound, once it reaches my hearing aids, are then going through the programming of the hearing aid, which compensates for that 90 decibel severe bilateral hearing loss that I have. And the sound that I ultimately get fed to my ears is a lot more understandable than anything else. But the key is, the person has to talk into my third ear, which in this case is the microphone of a battery-powered handheld transmitter. Uh, the transmitter itself is a little bit thicker than a highlighter pen. And it has a very thin antenna running off of it that's about the same length as the actual transmitter. You hold the microphone, you talk into the top of it, and it transmits wirelessly, and these are both battery-operated. For a meeting like this, since you already have an established sound system, you can turn these individual microphones that are on your table into the third ear for your hard of hearing colleagues by simply adding an FM transmitter to the mixer of your existing system. And so instead of feeding it to a tape recording or feeding it to the loudspeakers, you would feed it to the transmitter that would then transmit to each of these receivers. So that's something I'd like to just offer to you. If you'd like to try this out, I'm going to pass around two headphones and receivers, and you're welcome to give it a try. Now, the nice thing about these headphones, they're very, very durable. We got this equipment over 14 years ago. The headphones haven't broken yet. And they only cost about $20. Now, you can let go of the headset. And all you need to do is turn the thumb wheel towards me to make it louder, and went that way towards Ruth to make it softer. Go ahead and adjust it to your comfort level. Well, I've okay. got some hearing aids. Okay. okay. So set the bottom to where it sounds comfortable for you to listen to. And uh, I said to Ruth that given that she's here for the meeting tonight, I'll be happy to stay and let you guys uh, utilize your system for the duration of the meeting so she'll be able to follow what's going on. Um, so an assistive listening system is just one example of what's on okay. it. One, mm -hmm. I, I would just like to talk about this for sure. a minute. Ever since we got this system, yep. I'm completely deaf in this ear, and it was due to a viral infection three years ago that I got. Ever since we got this, I can hear so much better. That's great. With this system. That's great. Most people don't realize the importance of helping individuals hear better. They don't realize there are things what we would call communication ramps. Uh, it's very difficult to be in an environment like this and not know what somebody is saying because exactly. people take they're hearing for granted. Right, because before we had nothing. Yeah. Absolutely nothing. And we have an excellent system here that Patty and I worked with, um, what's his name, Alan and them to make sure that we had the appropriate system for people who do have a hearing loss. Sure. And um, I, I, I do have to say that I don't have my hearing aids on today right now, but I have my hearing doctor from Bay State Medical. I have a system that's unbelievable. It cost me $7,500 wow. for it. Yes. This ear is completely deaf, but on hearing aid, it has the antennas, which you cannot see, which goes over to this ear. Right, and this the cross style hearing, hearing aid, yes. Exactly. And at city council meetings, I have designed so I can just press a little small. small. Okay, uh -huh. press to the volume I want and take away the noises that I want. Okay. Well, I'm very glad you're having a good experience like that. Now, I'll try it. Uh, with assistive listening systems, again, that helps somebody who has some residual hearing. And if the individuals don't wear hearing aids, they could wear a good pair of headphones. Sure. Uh, or they make an under chin type of what looks like a stethoscope dictation type of earpiece. Uh, for those who wear telecoils in their hearing aids, they would wear either a neck loop, a necklace of wire plugged in, or what looks like a little fishing hook upside down called an ear hook, silhouette. And that would be worn near their hearing aid or their cochlear implant processor with the telecoil coupling happening in that regard. Mm -hmm. How um, many of those do they do a year on the implants? Do you know? I'm sorry, so that was Once somebody goes completely deaf, how many implants do they do a year? You know, I'm not an expert about cochlear implants. That's a whole other subject matter than what the commission does. Uh, there are individuals, in fact, who I can say are eligible for cochlear implants that several years ago would not have been considered. Yeah, because uh, I'm considered one. If I lose it on this area, they're going to do it. That's great. That's great. So you've really given it a lot of thought and researched that. That's important. 
Uh, choosing to get a cochlear implant is definitely a personal choice. Uh, and for some individuals who have been part of the world where they've had their hearing, uh, when you get to the point that your hearing is not functioning for you, and that is, if you've been approved to be a good candidate for the surgery, that's great. Uh, I know individuals from young children to senior citizens who've gotten implants at different stages of their life. Uh, and one of my colleagues, I know we're a little off the point for just a second, but one of my colleagues said that she found it was very important for her to do her own oral rehabilitation, which meant she would be listening to books on tape while she was reading the book so that her brain would associate the printed word with how the processor was delivering the audio yeah. to her to be able to uh, reassociate the new stimulation she was getting with what she was seeing in print to kind of make sense out of it, to help help build it. Now, I don't have a cochlear implant, but I have friends who do, and I guess the way I could relate it to you in that regard would be uh, if somebody had a problem where they couldn't distinguish the color red, but they could see the shape of the stop sign, or they could see a certain shade of gray, and they've been told that color is red. They learn to know, when I see this shade of gray, I need to call it red. They don't see it the same way. Well, with a, a cochlear implant processor, um, the electrode that's implanted into the cochlea is sitting on the surface where the hair cells are or have been destroyed or damaged. And it creates an electrochemical stimulation there. And so it's a different sense information happening at that point that has to be fed along to the auditory nerve to the brain. Um, and I guess I would liken it, if I could, to the difference between somebody gripping your wrist where you feel that warmth and that pressure versus pins and needles in that area. So your body has to learn how to interpret a different sensation of information coming from the electrodes stimulating certain parts of the cochlea and then trying to reformat to make that mean something. Uh, one of my friends, when she first got her cochlear implant activated or mapped, she said people sounded like Donald Duck for a while till her brain began to make some sense out of it. Uh, but my friend Judy, who did the her own oral rehab, advises everybody, do books on tape and read the books at the same time. The more active you are in your own rehabilitation, the more successful and beneficial you'll be with your particular infant. So good luck either way on that. Also, I have a question. You work for the Massachusetts Commission for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing. We have many, many people here who have attended Clark School for the Deaf, and I have a very dear friend, Rodney Kunev, who is completely deaf. Okay, and he has stressed of his civil rights really being what's the word? Everybody? Violated. Violated. I am very surprised with the Massachusetts Commission for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing that we're not seeing you coming forth to make sure that on TV or any meetings throughout the state of Massachusetts has closed caption for deaf people. Why are you not doing something about this? And my question is, I have talked to a candidate running for Lieutenant Governor, Maura Healy. She agrees. This needs to be done. It's not something you just put to the side of a table. You're talking about quality of life. I'm asking you, how come the Massachusetts Commission is not doing something about this? Um, Can you answer that? Please? First of all, that's an excellent question. Um, now, I'm speaking as an individual, as an employee of state government. Mm -hmm. And there are various distinctions about what state government employees can or cannot do while they are employed by the state. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to political campaigns or meetings and things of that sort, um, so it's important for you to understand that the commissioner would be the one that you could bring this question to. Um, but and has anybody ever raised that question to you? What, what a closed caption. What I'm saying is this, that we, be, we have been made aware of, for example, a number of meetings being held by various individuals who are running for elections. Now, these were people sort. running for elections. This was actually done by Comcast. Oh, we, Comcast. We had a huge meeting with them in the city of Northampton, and it was brought up by Rodney Kunith about many meetings that are not being televised and they're not closed captioned, and he's completely deaf. So okay. I'm not now, talking about okay. politics here. I'm talking about quality of life. OK. Now, I appreciate a little bit of clarification. I have a question for you, though. Yep. The Comcast, let me back up a minute. The, uh, 
the programs that were being viewed on the Comcast cable network, were those generated by Comcast or were they produced by, say, government access programming or what? I think by Comcast, right? Yeah, but they're like, you're talking about like this kind of meeting that's recorded that Rodney wants to go out and look at online. Right, right so, but I'm not talking, I'm talking about with Comcast, how they do all kinds of things on TV or any kind of commercials or anything like that. You never okay. see anything with a closed caption. You have okay. to turn it right. on. But, but, uh, um, okay. We're That's ready. my question. You get commercials on TV or oh. anything like that. Okay, okay. Well, and if you're deaf, you don't know what they're saying. Yeah, you do. Believe me, as an individual with a severe hearing loss all of my life for 54 years, my personal policy is that if there's a news network that is choosing to do good captioning, and one that's doing very poor captioning, I will patronize and watch the programming that is accessible, and I will complain about the shows that are not. Who do you complain okay. to? Well, I happen to live in Connecticut. Oh, okay. Or, you know, but you're saying to go through the commission? But, but what, I, what, what I need to explain to you is this, that let's just say, for example, you have here, and I'm not trying to put the commission on the spot, but no. you have uh, community programs that are generated through your public access channel. Right. The public access channel is given a budget by which it has to operate. Well, I understand that. And out of that budget, they would have to come up with a way to generate the captioning of the programs that they've developed. That's why NCTV, we had that huge meeting with the city of Northampton and Comcast to help NCTV financially. Okay. Okay. To uh, be able to do closed caption because gotcha. we have many people in the city who so you're asking Comcast to sponsor the cost right, to make it happen. Heard anything. But why would you have to do that? I don't think, wait a minute, Ruth, I don't think anybody, okay, should have to say, well, we need somebody to sponsor us. I think it should be a law, mandatory law, just like somebody that's blind, somebody that's deaf, that you are able to have a good quality of life. I would be, as an individual with hearing loss, I would be behind you 100%. What I'm saying is that, that there is a law that was passed, it was the 21st century uh, captioning. It's a long title. Uh, but it essentially says, for example, that if a programming broadcast was captioned, and it's gonna be airing on the internet, you know how they have the opportunity to go right. online to be able to view a program, there's a different format used for broadcast captioning than for the technology that appears on the internet. So essentially a program has to be captioned differently to be used by that format. They're, they're not compatible formats, right? Uh, or to put it in another perspective, if you had a floppy disk, you couldn't run it on today's computers. There's no drive to support that unless you get an auxiliary drive kind of thing. Uh, since the technology used for broadcast captioning is different from the way they embed the captioning to the way they do it for the internet. Um, the law says that now those individuals who produce programming that's captioned have to make sure that the programming when it's made available on the internet is also accessible. There have been a lot of laws over the years. There have been phased in periods because you've had individuals say, well, it's gonna take us a while to get our equipment and procedures in place and get the funding in place and get the staffing in place because it's done by not somebody sitting with a, a high-speed typewriter, but individuals who are either using steno machines or specified software um, and have necessary skills and training to do it at a very accurate level to make it happen. Um, so there's some hardware involved, there's some software involved, there's some human beings involved in making captioning happen. Yeah. What's important to do as a consumer, as an individual in Massachusetts, is when you are watching something, if Comcast is your provider, and I've had this happen. We have several televisions in our home and the primary television with the big set-top box is showing the program. The little, tiny little box the, for the smaller TV, mm -hmm. I'm seeing the captioning appear on the smaller TV but not on the program on the bigger one. I go online, I go and I call up customer service with Comcast, I give them my account information, I say, I'm getting the captioning if I watch it on my little set in the kitchen, when I watch it on our set top, it's not working. What are you guys doing? Because somebody's messing the transmitting signal. If I'm getting it, but I'm not getting it on once, somebody's messing around somewhere. You guys need to check on that. If I want to watch a particular program, 
and it's not accessible to me. For example, a lot of public access programs are not accessible because, and I'm not saying this justifies it, but nobody is thinking of communication access as something you budget for. You have to have money there to pay for the card provider, to pay for the technology, to be able to have that captioning done. Well, I guess and do it in an accurate way. Then they shouldn't be on TV, they shouldn't do these things, yeah. unless they have the budget, they have the funds to give everybody a good quality of life. I totally agree with you. You know, we have a civil rights meeting coming up through the district attorney's office, and I've already talked with our district attorney a week ago, because I went to another meeting, and this has become a serious issue of closed caption. Okay. Well, I'd be happy to take whatever information you have and share it with the commissioner of our agency, um, and she can then move it forward appropriately. Um, Who is it? Commissioner Heidi Reed. If you visit our state website, there is a place there where you can click on a link that would be able to send an email directly to the commissioner's office. That's super, thank you. Okay. And you could advise her of what's been going on and what's been transpiring so that she can be made aware of the situation. Um, again, the role of the role for us is in the area of education and in making sure that people have access to a good quality of life. They have access to accessible employment. They have access to accessible health care. They're able to stay in housing that is safe and accessible for them. Uh, we're not saying we're not, but we need to be made aware of the issue. I don't know if Commissioner Reed has been aware of the fact that this has been a hot, hotbed issue for the community yet. But if we're not if we're not aware that there's a problem, there's nothing that we can do to help mm -hmm. as we can as a state agency if we're not being informed of it. Um, so, by all means, feel free to go to our website, which is www.mass.mass.gov, G-O-V, yeah. slash M-C-D-H-H, and that's for G -O -V Massachusetts slash. M-C-D-H-H? Right. M for Massachusetts, yeah. C for Commission, right. D for Dale, H, H H for Heart of Hearing. Okay. And on that first page, as you scroll down, there's a link there. You can contact the commissioner, click that, and it will get it to the commissioner's office That's and she'll so be made aware of it. That would be the most important thing to do. Right. Um, then based on what she is, what she can determine about who to get involved in that particular situation, she either will delegate it to an individual or a department. She may refer it to an outside agency, another state agency that has responsibilities to be, to help them become informed of the situation. Mm -hmm. uh, but that would be the, the point of contact to start with. At this How do you point. spell her last name? Uh, well, her first name is H-E-I-D-I. -I, I got that. And last name is R-E-E-D. -E Reed. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Carol, um, we need to wrap up in a few minutes. Is there anything else that you wanted to share with us about the work of the commission? Um, well, uh, I did bring some information with me that I wanted to share with you, and I will keep it brief because I realize you have a lot on your agenda. Mm -hmm. um, our commission has several departments, public education and training, the ones that do the uh, outreach to individuals with hearing loss, like myself. Uh, that staff exhibits at health fairs and we go out and we do in services. We will train elder service providers. We go out and train police and firefighters and emergency service providers. Um, we go out to groups of individuals that want to learn more about hearing loss and we talk to them about the different resources and services that exist. I do some specific services in what we call hard of hearing services, essentially consultations with an individual that may or may not involve their family. And we will look at all the different issues that come up from their ability to understand phone conversations to whether or not they're very tech savvy and are comfortable using apps, for example, on a cell phone. Uh, whether they have difficulty knowing when someone's at the door, if they're expecting meals on wheels or a repairman to come to the door and they've missed that kind of thing. Um, are they having difficulty getting up in the morning in order to make it to their medical appointments? Um, are they able to understand their television or are their neighbors in the apartment building yelling because their TV is too loud? Uh, can they utilize an assistive listening system like I have here? Uh, so I will walk them through the different things that they might benefit from and try to plug them into things, such as you mentioned about the expensive cost of hearing aids. 
Uh, some people fall through the cracks with the different types of programs that are out there. There's not a whole lot of funding options out there, but I try to make them aware of what might help them either get a hearing aid, get a listening device, get a signaling system for their home. Uh, in some cases, there might be grant programs that are out there with other state agencies. For example, the State Department of Public Health obtained grant monies through FBMA, FEMA. And this was a while ago, and they were able to obtain auxiliary signaling devices that were approved by the state fire marshal. These signaling devices are to help a person who's deaf or hard of hearing, considered at risk, to be alerted to a smoke detector or a carbon monoxide detector. And so individuals who were selected were provided with training by the fire departments on fire safety and fire prevention. And then they're having these auxiliary signaling devices installed in their homes or their apartments to tr as one more additional way of trying to help them be safe in their home environment. Yeah. Um, so we may not be the ones that have the monetary resources to provide you with the devices, but we will try to plug you in to let you know what's out there in terms of equipment and things. So that you don't actually go to people's homes? I will go and I will sit and meet with people in their homes. Is that the girl you were uh, telling me that? Ruth has been the benefit of that uh, service, hard of hearing service in the past as well. Yes. She was supposed to come for a couple of hours and stay all day. <laughs> That's great. Well, that wouldn't go in my home. Uh, I, I usually tell time. people to plan for about a two hour session because I try to go at a slower pace for some folks to try to get a sense of what their issues are and help them get comfortable with what they want to know about. So there's an awful lot of things. And I'd rather come back and do several short visits. Uh, but sometimes folks want me there, and it just, <laughs> it just goes that's a little longer. Well, that's great. Uh, so I brought with me some handouts that I, I will pass them out. I just want to describe what they are. Uh, one is the information sheet that's on our website. Uh, if you would like access to that in an alternative format, please let me know. Uh, it describes the fact that we have the social, social workers the case managers who will coordinate services for people that have complex life issues. Um, Someone might say, I just got a letter in the mail, so security's going to stop sending the check as far as they're concerned, I'm dead. And they try to go through the automated menu, they go down there, try to meet with people face to face, and because of their hearing loss, there's communication breakdown. Mm -hmm. Or they have to go to court dealing with the housing authority and not having an accessible and safe housing environment. So the case managers will be involved and make sure that the related services are doing their part in an accessible way. And then we have a department that handles requests for sign language interpreters, card providers, that type of thing. They match up these specialists who provide that kind of accommodation with individuals and entities that want those services. And they take care of the billing information between the requester and the provider of those services. So that's a little bit of info there. We have contracts with independent living centers such as Stavos, which Patty handed out applications with. Um, right now, though, Stavos does not have a hard of hearing specialist. So they will do an initial intake with a consumer, and if they can help with a piece of assistive technology, they have someone there that will help them look through a catalog to try to find, say, a doorbell signaler. But they will tend to refer those consumers to me and I will either meet with them or help solve their problem. Or, and I don't claim to be an expert. I try to find the resources that would be appropriate for them. So I have a handout on that, uh, a handout on the hard of hearing services, a little bit about the kind of trainings that we do, uh, and a one, side, a one sheet of paper with some photographs on it of different types of assistive technologies. And I brought along two catalogs to give you an idea of what's out there as far as adaptive equipment goes. Mm -hmm. um, but needless to say, uh, if you are dealing with an individual that has a hearing loss or a concern as you've raised here, bringing it to our attention is the first step. Uh, and for example, if you have somebody who's dealing with an employment issue, believe it or not, it would be Mass Rehab Commission or who would be the primary person that would address employment issues. And if you're still running into problems and that individual has a hearing loss, you want to make sure that you get in touch with us because maybe the case managers, the social workers might need to be involved. If you're dealing with an individual with hearing loss and vision loss, the primary service provider would not be our agency, but the Commission for the Blind, because they have a deaf-blind unit, mm -hmm. and they are considered to be the first point of contact or the primary point of contact, and we support that with services mm -hmm. for deaf-blind individuals in form of sign language interpreters and that type of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so we are a resource. Most people don't know we exist, uh, but we're happy to be of help any way that we can. So thank you for allowing me to be here tonight, and thank you for your questions. I hope. That's been a help to you. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Great. 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 Great.
So whatever handouts are still left, um, we can put them with our, we have a bulletin board that's for Commission on Disability mm -hmm. where people can take right. handouts. And I'll put a set in the library. That would be great. Um, is that the new book? Uh, this is the new catalog. Thank you so much. You're that welcome. Was yes, really interesting and informative. Appreciate your coming. Thank you. a lot. Thank you. Okay. Um, moving on with our agenda, the next item is an update on handicap parking in Florence. How do you think? Sure, can be. And um, Council of Arch can add to it if she would like to. Um, so uh, that's still in the process, but we, I did get an email today from. Um, Alex Bublik from the DPW that the sign for the handicap parking in front of Miss Florence Diner is getting put in on Friday. Excellent. That's the parking space that already existed, but a sign had never gotten put up there, so that will be taken care of. <clears throat> and then the other one is that's all through council now. The one in front. Uh, the, the one in front of Birds. Okay. The one in front of birds, we approved that two weeks ago on a second reading, and I thought it was understood both of the signs were going up together. Okay, well then maybe on Friday that one in front of birds is going as well. I'll, I'll put that. Yeah, and I and I'll nice if we could push that. Yeah, I'll reread the um, email. Oh, I'm I'm glad to hear that the birds went through. Um, Patty and I had both gone to speak at city council. Yes, yeah. So that's good. So now uh, Florence has two handicapped spots right on Main Street, well, on the Main Streets, so Main and Main Ball. And Tori, I want to thank you, I want to thank Patty for coming to City Council for open public session in favor of all City Councilors supporting the handicapped parking. Thank you, I was thank happy, you. happy to be there. Um, an update on the bet, and the next item is update on the benches being placed in the center of Florence. Um, Councilor Labarge and I, um, just to give a little background again, um, met with Rich Parcelletti and um, Jim Larilla from DPW um, to look at various spots in Florence. Three spots were selected for two um, benches. The, council, the uh, Commission on Disability voted at the last meeting to appropriate up to $3,500 for the two benches. Um, at this point, um, Jim Lorella, who's also a member of the Florence Business and Civic, presented the um, concept of two benches in uh, Florence. And um, that group decided that um, benches weren't needed. Um, so basically what that was saying is no to the benches. Um, if, and again, this was the bench idea was generated out of this um, commission. And it was, there are, you know, some benches in the parks at the, um, in Florence, but the idea was that there are people who are uh, persons with disabilities and who are elderly who walking, uh, you know, a large distance uh, are not able to do that adequately or um, to do it to keep, you know, maintain their health. They can be out of breath. They could, you know, have a variety of issues. Um, so that's, you know, the benches weren't our thought here was not for um, people to sit there and socialize and have fun and eat their ice cream and all of that. It was for the purpose of assisting those who were um, mm -hmm. elderly or um, persons with disabilities, right? Well, um, so uh, if, if, again, this all generated out of this commission, um, and if, if we really want to um, continue to see benches in there, because it's, again, Commission on Disability felt this was a, a real need um, for Florence, um, that we could um, recommend that the mayor um, send a, a, a letter. We, we sent a letter to the mayor um, encouraging him to support our concept of having two benches um, in Florence. We do also have the owners of the Florence Diner, when we did our first site visit, who agreed about having a bench placed out in front. I want you to understand, we didn't have to go to the Florence Business Association. The sidewalks belong to the city of North Anton. We were being very polite about letting them know what we'd like to do. 
we had two site visits, one with Alyssa Klein to consulate from Ward 7, Patty and I first looking at the sites that where we'd like to place them. Then what Patty said about um, Jim Larillo, who's the assistant engineer for the Board of Public Works, um, Richard Pasoletti, who's superintendent of streets, Alyssa Klein could not make it with Patty and I, and we showed them these sites that where we'd like to place them. At that point, Jim said he couldn't figure out how come there never has been any benches on the sidewalk in Florence, if you can recall that, Patty. Anyways, he said that he's on the board and he for not saw a problem with it. What we are being told with the emails that I shot to Patty was that Jim had stated that they felt that there are benches in the park, the new mobile station, is going to be putting one or two benches on their private property. The Florence Savings Bank, which I didn't know until Patty questioned it with Richard Pasoletti, that they also own the sidewalk too in front of the bank. I was very surprised with that. But just to give you a heads up, they do not own the sidewalks. The city owns the sidewalks, okay? Mm -hmm. Patty and I, I let Patty know there was a meeting being held this week. We could have attended that meeting, okay, with the Florence Business Association in regards to finding out what is the purpose of them not wanting the benches on the sidewalk. Mm. As a counselor, I don't want to hear from anybody to say, well, we don't want people just sitting there all day or sleeping on benches because that's not the purpose of putting benches that we want to do. Exactly. And Patty said exactly the way it is of what we want to do. I am hardly, highly suggesting Patty and I have a meeting. Alyssa Klein, I had shot you over the email with the owner of that, what is that? Uh, yeah, my, 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 right. And we need to do this, yeah, Patty. Yeah. We need to go see her, get her opinion of it, because she's on the board also. And then we need to go to a board meeting. There's no question about it. And I think we need to present a letter from the Commission on Disabilities of being in favor of doing it. And I think Ruth had a lot to say about it when I told her, and I wish you would speak right now, because I think you are absolutely correct. And I think it is a civil rights here for anybody who has a disability. And like Patty was saying, walking, even a child, an elderly person telling them that they're going to have to go across the street to a park. All the way from one end to the other end to sit down. If you're disabled, like when I'm walking, just going from Florence Diner to the post office is a hike for me. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, correct. Absolutely yeah. correct about it, Ruth. Yep. I mean, what is your feelings? Why do they feel they have the right to refuse anything? They can say, well, we don't think it would be a good idea, but they can't, they don't own the sidewalks. That's we right. own the sidewalks. They rent the buildings. We're giving them something free. If they feel that they're going to be used by the homeless, then that's what we pay the police for. They can enforce it. But you've got, you can't deny everybody everything because you don't want one little section here. I mean, right. this is, our rights. We're, we're giving them something to help elderly, disabled, families with children. Just yep. like you when you walk. And all yep. because they don't want one little block of society to be able to sit in the sidewalk, they're letting the whole rest of Florence suffer for it. And they don't have that right. At least I don't think they have that right. They don't yeah. own those sidewalks. And Jim did say that. He was asked that. He said, no, they do not own the sidewalks. And, and I don't, you're an attorney. What do you feel about this, Jim? Yeah, I mean, we saw what happened in downtown Northampton here when they removed those benches, and, and that was a real big misstep by the yep. mayor, and it was short lived, and um, it was just uh, a very unpopular move. Yep. In yes. Northampton was in the piece. So I, I'm going to say we. And that's why our city councilor, Maureen Carney, <laughs> as quickly as possible, did some research of other states and so forth on benches, and yeah, the wording wasn't all that perfect, but we had to move on something quickly because we were outraged. Yeah. We never even knew of this happening. The community was. I mean, there's a bench right in front of my office, and one day the bid people just uh, were taking them out. Yeah. They were gone. And, yeah. I remember and, that. And uh, people were very upset. Mm -hmm. So how do you feel as an attorney with this commission 
of us writing a letter to the Florence Business Association. I don't know what you yeah. would recommend. Yeah, I mean, um, they're kind of a sister organization. I belong to the Greater Chamber, uh, North Asia Chamber of Commerce, and Florence has their own unique business association, mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and to reach out to them because certainly our experience in and Florence is a subsection of Northampton. Yep. They, they are. I mean, they have their own zip code, but they are part of Northampton, yep. just like Leeds is. It is, but yeah. they're like a little entity of themselves. You know, know that. They have their own zip code, the 1053 yeah. Leeds. And so, all the if, if we write a letter, would you be willing to write some language for us? That would be very helpful. Yeah. Really, making sure that it's written correct. So, can I just add something here? Um, so, I just want to say that um, all. I know from anything about this situation is that the um, Florence Business and Civic said that they weren't need the benches weren't needed. There wasn't any any indication about why. So we don't really know. So I don't you know I don't think it's fair to say that they're segregating a group of people or I don't I don't. Nobody's saying that. Well, no. I think with what Ruth had said that to take a pocket of people that they may not want on those benches. We don't know that. Unless you no, know I something, know I don't sure. know. I, just, I think that, that may be an assumption. It's They said that we they do not need more benches in Florence. That's all we know. Why that is, I don't know. I wasn't at the meeting. You weren't at the meeting. Mm -hmm. And I think we got limited um, information from Jim, um, Larilla from the DPW, who's also a member there. Um, so I, I don't want to discredit the association because we don't know what it means when they say we don't need more benches. So you're saying like, maybe we need more clarification about their reasoning and then have a dialogue exactly. with them That's about exactly that. That's exactly what it's all about, right. Troy. But I, I would like to um, suggest to the um, commission that you know we ask um, through a vote. Well, first of all, I think there's two things. One. If we're going to have two benches, where are the two benches? Because we looked at three different sites. So where would right. the two be? And then request of the mayor through a vote here to, to intervene and assist the Commission on Disability to get these benches through in Florence. Because as you right. said, the benches can be there because the city owns those sidewalks. One more thing. I, I understand that, but why would you need the mayor to step in to get the benches there. Well, he represents our city. Representing us <clears throat> with the commission of the reasons why we want to do this, send it to the mayor also, that letter, Maybe and should. ask him for his full support. should invite them to discuss it. That's a good idea. I was just, just thought The mayor that. does attend the Florence Business Association. Yeah, he does. That's correct. Yeah. How about you know, somebody from But I think if we sent a, a separate letter, like you're saying, Patty, to the mayor to ask him, but show him the letter that we're writing to send to the Florence Business Association of our reasons why we want to put it there, because of people with yep, disabilities, yep. with walking disabilities, and then sending that letter to the mayor along with another letter to the mayor asking for his full support of allowing us to place two benches on city sidewalks. What about what about having someone from the Florence Business Association attend one of our meetings to have a clarifying conversation about what they're thinking and what we're thinking and try to work it out collaboratively? Well, I would rather go to one of their meetings. It's easier. Okay. And also, we've already talked with a business owner. We got one cleared already. I'd like to go to another business owner. But we did have that opportunity to go to this week to that meeting, and I really think we need to go to one. And just for a little. And those are at one o'clock, Tori, in the afternoon. Oh, that would be difficult for me, but mm -hmm. can someone go? But I still would like to have the letter sent. I think that's important, and then attend the meeting. So can we have a letter that goes to the Florence Business and Civic, you know, just, um, you know, if it is to be invited to their meeting and to, um, you know, get clarification and to send a letter to the mayor asking for his support um, for the Commission on Disabilities uh, idea of uh, having benches placed, two benches, I think is what we're, we've been talking about in um, Florence Center. I think the first choice is the Florence Diner. Second choice is my dad. 
Yeah. Um, so I mean, if we're well, if we well, I I, I don't remember if that was the second choice because one on one each side, one at um, we're on birds. birds on, um, yeah, I know what you're talking yeah. about. So you know, you have birds. Here's Maple, and here's I believe yeah. that's still Meadow Street right there. Um, that it would be right there on that corner, and then uh, Miss Flo's definitely was um, what everybody wanted. Who was at that meeting on that day? Just for information, you might want to include it in the letter or not. But um, Bill and I have driven by today. We drove by twice, um, both ends where the benches are, and I made a note just to check for myself. Every bench was full, both up at the, where the water fountain is and in the park at the other end. All the benches had people on; they were all full. Just so you know, there are being park, Trinity Road Park. The fountain is not operable there. No, but that's so you're just sitting on the bench. Yeah, I'm just stayed, I was just trying to point mm -hmm. where I was talking about. Right. You know, yeah. that end and this end. When you come out, you go by the church. Well, a lot of the people that use that are from across the street, mm -hmm. and which is great because yeah. I love sitting there because the fountain is there, and I also saw a couple of parents with their children and the little kids were going in the fountain. But here, here's a point. So those benches are full. But if you went to Florence Savings Bank, which bench would you go to? Because now you have to walk. Yes. And where could you sit in between? I know, I'm not. There we go. <laughs> if, when I go to Florence Savings Bank, I try to sit on their wall outside because there isn't a bench close enough for me to get to. Exactly. Right. They so, I mean, that's the point of our benches so that persons with disabilities or those who are <clears throat> elderly or have difficulty walking and need to stop um, that's with the benches to enjoy it of course and certainly socialize but it has a bigger purpose mm -hmm. um, at least that's the impression that I've gotten from our members I mean and from the public who have who brought this idea to the Commission members and furthermore maybe the public didn't realize, okay, <clears throat> that the Florence Civic Association was in charge of sidewalks. I think, How do we know all this? Well, I think your point about, um, you know, that there were city sidewalks, and as a courtesy, um, having it brought up at their meeting, um, I think we're and then the decided, yeah. Knowing yeah. what yeah. we want to yeah. do, and... Just yeah. tell them we're doing it. Yeah. Yeah, oh, I mean... They don't have the power to say no, just say, we're doing it. I mean, say, like with Hannah, I've seen Hannah on Main, on Main Street. There are benches, if she wants to rest and sit, she can, correct? Right, yeah. You know, we get to point, you're at point A and you're going to point B, but what do you have in between that can assist you to um, health, to, to be still healthy when you get to the next you know, yeah. point um, you know, in I, between. I will call Jim tomorrow and ask him exactly what to present to them. Because sometimes that language is important. Also, what I really would like to see, I don't know Ruth, how you feel about it or Gary or anybody, I think a letter should be written up. We have Jim, who is an attorney. The wording would be very professionally on the way yes. it would be sent to the Florence Civic Association and also one to the mayor. Asking um, one is with a civic is what what's the explanation and the letter to the mayor to ask for his support and exactly. endorsing and <clears throat> again supporting it. So do, is that a motion? Are you making a motion? I'll second it. All in favor? Thank you, Jim, for helping us with that. I never thought it would be this bad. I. Thought this was going to be just like a quick update. Right. Like, oh, it's fine. Oh no. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, we have another major agenda. Agenda. Excuse me. Yeah. Agenda. <laughs> um, which, since we're not meeting next month, we need to discuss now. Which is um, our September meeting with a roundtable discussion and social. You know, I didn't bring my papers, but I read them all to the Ruth yesterday. I have notified several towns already that are going to be showing up. So what I'll do is the ones that I have contacted, Stravos is coming, Amherst, um, Hadley, and a bunch of them. East Stanton is coming, whatever. So I called today, people? the two that you asked me to call yesterday, and I actually did get people, and they're going to be checking into it and calling me back. 
they have to do scheduling. Which one stuff. were they? I don't remember. I didn't bring it with me either. Oh, I know. So are we going to know how many people? So about how Tori many people just are saying, coming? Do we think? Because we need to plan. We for have until the whole month of August, so. So I it's kind of. But we're not right now. But we're not having. Well, just meeting. email you and let you know how many people will be showing up. Okay. So. Um, okay, that's fine. We're still searching. Okay. Okay. So can I we would say right now. <laughs> well, we'll put. Plan for 30 Probably people. Probably about five, six. Oh, okay. We can handle it. Okay. So, um, do we just want to have a conversation at all about what kind of food we want? Yeah. Let's have that conversation. It's supposed to be all little finger foods, correct? Right? That's what everybody had decided. Cheese and something. crackers and, right? And, and then we're going to do it from five to seven, approximately. No fruit. Yeah, sure. That's all part of it. <laughs> yeah. Who? I will be coming right from work, so I will not be able to pick stuff up. Who would be able to pick up food and get it here? Like where? Pick up like from the grocery store? Well, yeah, where are we going to? I mean, who has to come from somewhere? No, but we all bring something. Yeah. Like we always do. Okay. Oh, that's what we're doing. Yeah. Don't give it to us what like you're doing. Do a, like a potluck kind of thing? Yeah. Don't okay. think so? Yes, I think people decided last time it was not going to be like um, cooking on the grill and it was not going yeah, to be, it, keep it simple, I believe someone said. Okay. Right. So we'll be in touch by email when we know more about how many people. Right. right. You can put it in your head right now about five or six. Okay. And everyone will bring something along the order of fruit, cheese, and crackers. Yeah, and I think we should email to say, oh, right, what we're bringing. Okay, we my might bring a drink or something. Yeah. Do you want me to coordinate? Seltzer, water. Yeah, my suggestion was sure. that somebody coordinate this. Um, yeah. I'll be willing to coordinate it. Coordinate it? Sure. That would be awesome. There you so, go. So, Ruth, if you can send out an email to all the members to say this is happening and uh, please let you know what um, you can bring. Sure. Right. And then Thank you. updated information about how many people as we find out more so yep. that we know how many people the plan for. And we can provide all the paper products oh, here. Oh, the Senior Center? Yeah. 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 Oh, well, that's great. All right. Um, and thanks, Ruth, for being with us. Yes, Ruth. Here. Thank you. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, the, actually, I see here there was another item. Uh, public hearing September 15th from 5 to 5 to 6.30 on the vibrant cycle. Yes, this is a resolution that was placed, which um, Jim talked about all of a sudden how the benches were removed in the city of Northampton, and I'm a sponsor of it, Maureen Carney is, um, there's several of us counselors. Anyways, it went through a first reading last year, and there was some language that was shaky in it. So what we're doing now before we do the second reading, and we want to hopefully get this all cleared off so we can do that second reading and it's there. And the reasons for the vibrant sidewalks is exactly what we're trying to say about Florence. What sidewalks are all about for people to use them to sit, to people to associate, people who are disabled, whatever. This hearing is going to be open to the public under Social Services, Veterans Affairs, Cultural and Recreation, and it will be from 5 to 6.30 and open to the public, so you can talk about the vibrant sidewalks on the resolution. So I'm hoping that the Commission on Disabilities will attend. Thank you. I'm gonna ask Adam if I can record it. I'm gonna ask Adam if I can record it. Yeah. Do we have any other business or announcements? Oh, also, excuse me. I do know we'll be, we're going to try to shoot for another hearing in Florence on vibrant sidewalks, and we're not sure yet the date or where it's going to be held. Okay. So when you know that, if you could let me know, and I'll we do it right now. No, uh, right. but when you we do know, I can get out an email to everybody so we can get members yeah. there. Yeah. That would be great. Do we have any other business or announcements? Well, just a brief announcement on September 12th about you know, my birthday. The uh, yes. e. e. Prager oh, Memorial oh, is wait. going to have, uh, started two years ago in September 2012. We're going to have another induction class. 
uh, on September 12th, that Friday afternoon, and it's at the time. Uh, just as an aside, I'm accompanying my father. Uh, Norman went to get a drug store for 40 years. Yeah. He was prison of the Club and um, a member of Historical Northampton and the Historic Commission and the Elm Street Commission. Mm -hmm. He had a lot of things. So I think, um, and there's some other very worthy candidates I know will, uh, that the committee is debating. So just that's going to be right before our next meeting on that Friday. So uh, hopefully some of you can come there for the ceremony. It's going to be right on Main Street in front of uh, Captain Cross, Captain Cross the store. What time? They haven't said it's going to be that Friday afternoon, September 12th. Um, as we get closer, they'll say it, it'll probably likely be around three or four. That's when they did it the first time. Maybe you can send an email when you. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Okay. And have they stopped taking? Everything is going to be outside on the sidewalk. Yes, that's the way they did. Yes, mm -hmm. um, two years ago, right in front, they blocked off a uh, number of spaces. Yeah. Okay. They, they had quite a crowd. Yeah. They, it was a really nice tribute to. Uh, not just the interior, but all the people that are on there. So we have a parking garage thanks to, to uh, Mr. Gear. I know. So. Well, look what we did for Eva, too. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Have they stopped taking I nominations? I'm um, sorry. I, I just got a letter about it. Right, and, uh, right. I, no, I think it's still open. Okay, because um, I, I don't recall what it said. Right, and um, you know, I, there's, you know, there's yeah. a. I'm sorry, I'm trying to get it in here. I missed what the event actually is. Well, it's, <laughs> it's formally the Eve Traeger Memorial. They're going to have an induction ceremony. Um, Eva, E-V-A, Traeger, T-R-A-G-E-R, uh, Memorial. And they're going to have an induction ceremony on Friday, September 12th. Time not quite set yet. But That's my girlfriend that died. Remember uh -huh. that day? Where the owls are. Right, exactly. There's an owl, and then there's names on yes. there. And they're going to add, hopefully, uh, some names that they approve. Mm -hmm. and, uh, you can actually go online and see the ceremony from uh, yes. last time. There's a lot of different pictures on there. Yeah. The chamber is heavily involved in that. The, uh, in fact, they're taking donations for the upkeep of, of the uh, memorial and for the cost of it. And they have a link on there to donate. Mm -hmm. you, but, you know, it's, it's a, I think it's wonderful. Yeah, it's kind of yeah. like the North Hampton Hall. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, right. And the Gazette had an editorial about a week ago after, before Chris died, mm -hmm. the cereals market, and they said yeah. she should be on there. And mm -hmm. I don't know mm -hmm. yeah. She should be on there. She should, yeah. Yes. Oh, that's good. Thank you. Any other announcements? No. Do we have a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Bye, guys. Thank <laughs> you. We'll be communicating by email. And Carol, yeah, thank we'll you. We'll be communicating yeah, by email. Thank you very much for coming. And I'll get the time and I'll send that out. Jim, do you want one of these booklets? Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for writing that letter up. Yes, yeah, absolutely. So, are you doing the letter? to the mayor, too, that you're going to break both of those letters? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, why don't we coordinate by email off the okay. mayor? All right, yeah, because the one from the mayor should uh, say that the, the commission voted unanimously. The only thing, though, is that uh, maybe it should be done on the last, on our letter. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'll start working on my thoughts. Yeah. Then, yeah, it doesn't have to be anything lengthy, just right. specific right. about what we want. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I Ours what, should be on the letterhead with the seal on it. Right. Oh, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, that's what Jim was yeah. saying. Yeah. Right. Which is weird. Mm -hmm. I, I, mean, I know what, you know, what, what Lewis was saying. Is like, I know the motivation for downtown Northampton, particularly the benches, was because um, some people, it was about people that they thought were either homeless or just sitting on the bench all day. Exactly. And that's why, um, but you know, the thing is, is there may be some people that. I don't want to say, use the bench by sitting there all day.